we have 49 participants. I'm giving it another minute and then we'll start. Seems like we're all here. Um, good afternoon once again. Welcome to workshop number three, lived experiences of implementing learning analytics at scale. Um, the workshop objectives would be explore, explore how institutions like Open University in the UK have implemented learning at, analytics at scale. Our facilitator is Dr. Bart Rintis, who is a professor of learner analytics and program lead of the learning analytics and learning design research program at the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University in the UK. He leads a group of academics who provide university-wide learning analytics and learning design solutions and conduct evidence-based research on how students and professionals learn. As an educational um, psychologist, he conducts multidisciplinary research on work-based and collaborative learning environments and focus on the role of social interaction in learning, which is published in leading academic journals and books. His primary re research interests are focused on learning analytics, professional development, and the role of motivation in learning. Furthermore, Bart is interested in broader internationalization aspects of higher education, and he has successfully led a range of institutional, national, and European projects, and has received a range of awards for his educational innovation projects. He has published over 250 academic outputs and is the fourth most cited, most cited, cited author and contributor in the learner analytics. In the period of 2011 to 2018, the fifth most, most published author on internationalization in the period of um, 1900 to 2018, and the third most cited author on the higher education internationalization in Asia in the period of 2013 to 2018, and the fourth, fourth most published author on social network analysis in the social sciences in the period of 1999 to 2018 and the 14 most, most published author on educational technology in the period of 2015 to 2018. We'd like to welcome you, Professor Bart Rintis, for this um, session. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Carmelita. I didn't expect that you would read all of that. Um, uh, <laughs> it's so very thank impressive. <laughs> thank you so much uh, for that. And, I appreciate on the last session and thank you so much for um, your, your really great contributions thus far. And I really enjoyed um, attending some of the sessions this morning. So um, I hope you can see my screens. And if for some reason I talk too fast or too slow, do let me know. I will try to follow the chat as well. Uh, so if uh, things go wrong or if you can't um, follow my points, um, yeah, let me, let me know. I've also posted in the chat the, the entire slide deck. Uh, there are lots of links in the slide deck. I won't be able to go through all the elements, but feel free to, um, to uh, use that. So um, first of all, I'm gonna do a little bit of shameless, uh, a shameless plug because um, we're currently working with a range of Kenyan universities. And I just gave a, a similar workshop two weeks ago where we had around a hundred um, scholars and teachers and managers in, from Kenyan universities. And they're currently following um, a, a program of, of uh, open educational resources um, that is designed by the OP University. So if you're interested in that, um, we can of course uh, afterwards share some of the materials as well. And in addition, we've been working for around four years together with the University of South Africa in the Ideas Partnership Project where we try to look at how can we um, use learning analytics to get a better understanding of how students at UNISA um, uh, worked. And um, as um, is also reflected in the project, 
it's really difficult. I guess that's that's another um, interesting thing. So if you're interested in how Unisa is doing this, um, have a look there. And last but not least, and this is again a shameless plug, um, we recently finished a really big edited book by uh, 15 PhD students who looked at uh, the notions of open world learning. And um, without technology, I wouldn't be able to deliver this uh, workshop at a distance. And in this book, we basically brought together how 387,000 students in 130 different learning contexts uh, work together. And several of the chapters in that book are, are specifically focused on learning analytics. So again, if, if you want to have, a, uh, have some free resources, these are freely publicly available also with a Creative Commons license. So I'm gonna now summarize the, the, the workshop talk. Um, and I will come back to this. And hopefully at the end of this uh, talk, you would agree that what I've provided as a summary makes uh, good sense. So what have we learned of implementing learning analytics and learning design at the Open University UK? Um, well, we've learned that change is slow, um, but it can be enhanced. And I'm hoping that what we're providing you today with is some hooks to help you to perhaps implement it in your own institution as well. And I've already seen this morning some really interesting um, examples. So one thing we've learned over the years is uh, you can only implement learning analytics if you have clear senior management support. Um, in 2013, we're very grateful that our Pro Vice Chancellor Blinda Tynum really pushed learning analytics. <clears throat> and we wouldn't be here at this point in, at, uh, at our development if there wasn't clear senior management uh, support. The second thing is what we've noticed is no matter how much support you get from the top, you need that uh, bottom up support from teachers and researchers who are willing to take risk. And you will see during the workshop today that um, many of the big changes we've been able to make were thanks to early adopters and teachers uh, and researchers who were willing to put their neck out to start to implement um, learning analytics. A third thing we've learned is by um, implementing learning analytics and combining that with evidence-based research, we can actually gradually change the perspectives and narratives around learning analytics. A lot of our colleagues um, are or were very skeptical towards learning analytics, but by continuously doing a bit of research with those teachers to see what works, what doesn't work, for whom does it work, for whom doesn't it work, we were able to gradually change uh, perspectives. Um, then one thing um, um, you, you often forget, and I forget this all the time, is you have to celebrate your small, uh, medium or large successes, because oftentimes when I'm giving keynotes somewhere else, um, people are like, wow, the Open University is so far ahead. And I always forget about how far ahead we are on certain elements and at the same time, how much we can learn from other institutions. So celebrate your successes. And last but not least, um, oh, sorry, this is not last but least, this is number five. Um, these large scale innovations take substantial time and effort. And I think what, for example, Yishan showed this morning and also Rogers is, it is really difficult to implement this um, even on a small scale, let alone on a large institutional scale like the OP University. And last but not least, I appreciate we talk a lot about learning analytics as a technical construct, but it's all about the people and how you bring uh, people together. And um, I didn't really know who would join us today. So I made some Paul EV slides. So what you can do is if you go to the next slide, I posted a link. Um, so you don't have to leave your name behind if you don't want to, I won't use your data, but if you click on the link paulev.com forward slash my name 552. Um, I didn't know which university would join. So I just put Masters University in as, as, um, as, the, um, as the handle. But it's basically, does your, should your university implement learning analytics in the next three years? And it would be really interesting to see whether you think in your own um, institution, whether or not you think um, you should implement learning analytics. And I'm gonna give you uh, one or two minutes time to think about this. And then later on, um, give you the opportunity, of course, uh, react. Um, and um, yeah, so I appreciate this is again, a new system different from Yisham. But uh, yeah, I'm keen to hear you. So thus far, it seems that um, most of you who are present think 
uh, it should be implemented. Surely there must be someone around here who disagrees um, with the uh, implementation. Um, all right. So basically, most of you think that um, we should start to think about learning and implementing learning analytics in the next three years. So the next question is then um, about, okay, could you in one sentence explain why you think um, you, your institution should implement learning analytics? So I'm going to give you again a minute or two and just type whatever you want to type. There's no right and wrong. And I will just... Um, um read out whatever you're saying so it could lead to thank you for that it could lead to improved decision making which is an interesting thought so it's to increase our understanding of how students learn it's evidence-based it's to improve the service that we're offering to our students you're giving some great thoughts here it gives us a window into how students engage online Again, it's about improving decision-making. It's for course design improvement, which I will talk about a little bit more. It's important to be able to analyze and assess students' journeys to improve strategic decision-making in an institution, um, to enhance decisions to improve student outcome, to support our students. So there are really some really interesting um, things coming in. All of them seem to be very positive, which is, which is fine. Does anyone want to share, and you can just turn on your mic or you raise your hand, does anyone want to share perhaps um, something that you're worried about? Because these are all very positive elements. Anyone brave enough to say, uh, I think this is all great, but I, I doubt this will actually work. That's fine, also, if it's not, but uh, so I see some really interesting uh, points. And of course, I, what I will do is at the end, I will uh, share this with Elizabeth so you can actually have a record of this. So Mukundu, uh, Mukundi, sorry, please tell us what you think. Well, um, <clears throat> hi, uh, but thank you. Uh, I think um, for me, uh, I'm an instructional designer. So I think, you know, in understanding, because uh, part of the most important work we do as instructional designers is needs analysis. And, you know, this, is, this sort of forms part of a basis for that to get a feel of who you are dealing with, what level they're at and so on, so that it better informs how you design, um, you know, online artifacts and learning material for the students. So for me, I think it's a it's a it's a it's a crucial resource. Those are my thoughts. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, and um, I've seen. I'm just scrolling through um, uh, through your excellent comments. I think it's um, yeah, it's really important. I mean, somebody mentioned also the resources are limited, and we need to optimally deploy them, supported by data. I think that's a really important point as well. Ashton, you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to add that. Um, you said that these things take time and I 100% agree. Um, but also the challenge in that is that uh, leadership expects it to take time and they, I'm finding there's this perception of it'll happen. But to me, I'm like, no, we need a five year implementation plan in order to get to where we're wanting to go. It's not going to just happen. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't agree it's more. It's not that simple, yeah. Yeah. So when I was referring back to the previous slide, I'm not sure if I can go back to the previous slide. Yes, I can. This clear management support is not just, yes, we need learning analytics. It, indeed, we had a five-year action plan. I think at that time it was a four-year action plan. This is what we're going to prioritize in year one. This is what we're going to prioritize in year two. And then we're hopefully going to learn over time because it is. it takes time, as you say. But yeah, you do need um, a clear sense of direction of travel so that also you can take your colleagues with you on that journey. Anyone else who wants to come in? Okay, 
So, um, and I mean, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to use the chat or just um, talk me through. So what I will do now is explain you a little bit about our, our experience. And then hopefully we can then translate that back to your, um, your local context. Um, so the Open University UK is the largest university in Europe. And the reason why I think learning analytics has taken off so well within the Open University beyond what I've already mentioned before is that we have a very diverse student population. You can see that a large number of our students don't have what we call formal A levels. So, oh, my computer wants to restart, which of course we don't want. <laughs> uh, let's do that for a day. All right, sorry about that. Um, and um, we have a lot of students who are basically already in work. Um, a lot of our students come from disadvantaged backgrounds, and I guess it's quite similar to what we found at, uh, at UNISA. So if you have students from lots of different backgrounds, lots of different uh, student needs, how do you then make sure that you can actually support them? And one way to support them is to use uh, data to see, okay, which students may or may not need a little bit more uh, support. And I guess that's one of the reasons why, um, according to Web of Science, we're apparently number one in terms of publishing, um, because we have A, a large um, institution, but B, we also have lots of problems, if you like. Um, so that's why I think it's really useful to use learning analytics. So what I will talk to you is, I will mainly talk about two things, because for example, when I made a screenshot, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had 85 publications on learning analytics. I can't talk through all 85 publications, so I will focus on two big things that we have done, which I think could be useful. So one is I'm going to sh show you the lessons we've learned from predictive learning analytics since 2013. And then I will share you something which we've been working on since 2005, which is called uh, learning design. And I will show you some of the dashboards there as well. So. Um, what I will start with is predictive learning analytics. And some of you may have already seen this, but I will briefly demo it in a second. So what we're basically doing in this flagship system called OE Analyze, we're trying to predict um, whether or not a student is gonna submit the next assignment. The reason why we're interested in submitting the next assignment is that we know from our own research and from others that if your student is gonna submit an assignment, he or she is probably gonna continue. Well, if your student is not submitting assignment, there might be something um, wrong. And we basically developed these dashboards for teachers, which I will show you in a minute. And that basically gives a very quick overview of which students are potentially doing well and which students are perhaps a little bit at risk. So how does that then work? So what we do is we have a, a range of predictive learning analytics and machine learning techniques. And what you see here is a kind of weekly um, type of activities that we um, would classify according to what our students does. And for example, a student here might two weeks before the course start, look at OU content and look, for example, at forums, do nothing, then look at OU contact, attend some resources, etc., and then eventually would submit the assignment and pass. And we could compare this with a student who, for example, doesn't do this. So a student who doesn't do this, for example, doesn't look at the forum, doesn't do nothing the week before the course starts, doesn't do anything week one and week two, and then suddenly looks at the forum and some structured context in week three. And if you compare this with a student um, who did successfully pass, you can see from this um, schema that um, in a way these students do slightly different things in a slightly different way. Of course, these are just two students. Um, so the, the, the choices that these students make can substantially differ. But if you do this across dozens and hundreds of students, you get uh, a Bayesian network, which looks something like this, which is very scary. Um, but what it basically does, it provides a, um, a visualization of what is the best pathways through a particular course that students can take. And of course, no person in its right mind can interpret this in the right way. So what we have is basically a, a dashboard for teachers, which I'm now going to show you. And hopefully um, the, the, uh, the demo will, uh, will work. I have anonymized the data. Um, but this is a real course. It's a real course in year two. 
and it has 664 teacher, uh, sorry, students currently in the course. And there are 416 who are active. And what you see in this visualization is how the students are progressing in terms of their average engagement and how well they're doing on their respective assignments that are participating in. The orange is basically the current cohort and the blue is the uh, previous cohort. So we're always comparing this with previous uh, students. And we're currently in week 30 and um, well, we're, we're about to get to the final assignment of this course. So as a teacher, this is really exciting because you can then start to see how well, how well the students are doing. You can, for example, make lots of inferences already like, hey, this cohort seems to be slightly less active than the previous cohort. I mean, I've, I don't teach this course. I have no idea. It's the first time that I look at this. And at the same time, you can then see um, the students that are in your uh, course. So these are real students, but we have anonymized them um, by an automatic machine learning program. So if I take the first 20 or 10 students, and if you would be the teacher of this particular course, um, you can just type in the in the chat, um, which of those students would you like to um, investigate? And then I will click that for you. And the first one who, who, who shouts, uh, I, will, uh, I will look into this. Let's go to Paris. Paris, okay, Paris, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so if we go to Paris, um, then a teacher can then see exactly what Paris is doing and how uh, Paris compares to the rest of the group. So what you can immediately see, um, the um, blue, and this looks a little bit strange, but the blue seems to be really flat, but that's because Paris ex is extremely active. Paris is very engaged does extremely well in comparison to the peer cohort, is super active in week 17 and 18, and is always doing well. And what the teacher can then see is um, a so-called risk profile of the student. And here the numbers are from zero to 100. And you can see, we think that there's a 91 to 100% chance that this student will pass because of course the student is super active. And here you can see the kind of activities that we know are really supportive or against the student passing. And um, this is useful information if you're a tutor at the Open University. And then we provide a week by week prediction of how the student is doing. So basically, this is doing this is a student that will uh, probably be extremely successful because this particular student is super active and is engaging with the right materials. So thank you for that uh, suggestion that, that also allowed me to explain a little bit about how the system um, works. So let's go back to the students. And this takes a lot of time. I can see everything. And normally it, uh, our tutors see between 20 to 30 students, so it takes slightly less time. So which other student would you be interested to look in, look at, sorry, in this particular case? Let's do Macy. Uh, Amelia says Macy is. Uh, here we go. Macy is flagged red, um, and Macy has been flagged red for quite some time. So what you see here is is a really interesting pattern. Um, so maybe is is anyone brave enough to interpret whatever is happening here? Just seeing seeing this particular visualization. Maybe I can try. Yeah, go, go. So it seems Macy started um, because was engaging, um, was active at the beginning. Yeah, very active, yeah. Yeah, and then after some time, dropped and picked up again. Then close to, say, the um, first quarter of the, of the um, session or the semester, Macy just dropped out or something and didn't even engage anymore in the... Um, you know, the LMS or whatever platform you're using. So uh, that shows it's, it's flat, and that's from the, the um, second and the third um, quarter, uh, will I say maybe, yeah, the uh, last two-third two of the, the class, it just didn't you know, 
participate any longer. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, sharing it. Sorry, I, I couldn't see in the screen who that was. So what was your name? It's Badrum. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so you're absolutely right. And what we can see even more if we scroll a little bit down is we can see that apparently she did not um, click on certain key activities that we know are the kind of gateway to success, like, for example, the summary activity in week six or seven. Um, at the same time, she has basically done a lot of credits already. So she obtained a lot of credits. So based on that, we initially thought that this particular student would submit, but this student didn't. Um, and then later on, we basically see lots of activities that we think are really important, but we're then are basically our algorithm learns about the student and eventually the student, we think, okay, the student is not gonna submit. So beyond just the engagement data, we also know kind of key pathways to, to, to success that we think is important. And you can quite clearly see um, that also our prediction started to change quite quickly from week seven to week eight. So this could potentially be a student. I don't know about this particular student, but it could be a student who just who had a uh, had a this uh, had a look at the course and then decided, okay, this course is not for me anymore, and then perhaps dropped out, or there's something else going on. So hopefully, whoever was this tutor for Macy would be in contact with Macy, and of course, we've also anonymized the uh, tutors' names in the data set. But um, in this particular case, let's have a look at what, what the fake name of this particular tutor was, if the data would like to load. Um, he or she would have to be in contact. So in this case, a tutor, uh, uh, Jenny Frey, uh, would then be hopefully in contact with her. So maybe just do one more. Um, which one would you, would you be interested in that is kind of on the borderline? Um, uh, uh, Isaac. Isaac. Let me see where Isaac is. Here we go. Isaac Ward. Oh, that's an interesting um, case. So there's also an, a quick indication here that, okay, there's a little bit of, um, we're not entirely sure what's going on there. So let's have a look at Isaac. And by the way, you, um, in the slides that I've shared, you can actually create your own account in the system and you can play with, uh, with the data as well. So is anyone interested to explain uh, what's, what you see in the data here and what, what you think is happening with Isaac? I mean, I don't know who Isaac is, but uh, feel free to turn on the mic and say what's going on. Um, I think Isaac is, is um, engaging um, with the plat with activities on the platform, but when it comes to academic performance, um, is not um, doing well with regards to his submissions. So I think when it comes to engagement, yeah, is is okay, but uh, his submissions are not that good. So yeah. maybe having issues with the um, learning the um, actual concept or the content of that course and it's not able to submit the rights, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you see that there's like, a, it's, a, it's a little bit like an on-off switch, it seems, you know, and in certain weeks, the student is not present. And then in other weeks, in particular, during assignments, the student is, is relatively active, but as you say, the assessment scores are lower than um, the average. I can see from the data that, for example, um, he or she does have a, a, a previous postgraduate qualification, but is also on a, this is um, UK speak for a, a poor, poor region. Um, and the student has a particular disability. Um, so there could be a multiple of reasons why the student is on and off on the virtual learning environment. And also, um, I mean, on the one hand, this predictive learning analytics seems to suggest the student is doing well, but at the same time, it's not doing as well as what we're predicting in the sense like we're predicting a certain high score and then the student only gets 50. So it's just barely scraping, scraping by. So the interesting thing for me would be uh, as a tutor is to, to, to really understand what's behind the data. 
And I'm hoping while I go back to who actually the tutor is in this data set, the tutor would know Isaac quite, uh, quite well because that tutor has been working with Isaac and the other 20 students. Um, and then hopefully the student would be able to be well supported uh, by, in this case, uh, Jorge Davis, whoever that person is. Um, so to me, what is really interesting is when there's a, suddenly a turn in the, in, in the narrative. So for example, I would be really interested, hey, there is this, for example, this Christina, which seemed to be doing really well. And then suddenly there is a red flag appearing behind that name. Um, and the system is really useful because it immediately identifies um, when a student is perhaps potentially at, um, at risk. And um, yeah, that's just really interesting. So what have we learned from this? Um, before, before we go to what have we learned, is there, are there any questions before I go back to the kind of presentation mode? All right, so if there are no questions, feel free to interrupt me at any point in time. So what we then did is try to see, okay, how does, how, uh, we have this amazing system and this system is continuously being fine-tuned based on feedback from uh, teachers. And in 2013, we worked with two teachers. In 2014, we worked with 10 teachers or 10 modules. In 2015, we had 58 um, teachers working with us. And you can basically see Gradually over time, the, the, the uptake of OU Analyze has, has been gradually growing quite rapidly over time. And currently our 7,000 teachers all have access to OU Analyze. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at the percentage of teachers who regularly um, use um, OU Analyze, it's been going down from around 90% in 2015 to around a third in um, 2019 and the latest data shows a kind of stabilization of the trend so around a third of teachers actively use the system but two-thirds do not so of course we were really interested to unpack that a little bit further and try to understand what were the reasons that some teachers really use it actively and others don't so what you see for example from this graph and this visualization that it's heavily influenced by the discipline. So in, for example, business and law, um, teachers are forced in between brackets or encouraged to really use OU Analyze and it's part of their job profile. So most teachers do. While, in, for example, in social science, it's not a requirement, it's a voluntary um, activity. So uh, in this study with uh, Theo Herodotso, we basically then also interviewed a range of teachers to try to understand why some were very active and others who are perhaps less active in OU Analyze. And we identified basically five uh, factors. One was, as I mentioned before, whether or not faculties were um, encouraging um, teachers to use OU Analyze. A second factor we identified, and this might be useful, is um, in certain faculties or in certain departments, they allocated teachers as champions. So these were teachers who were one of the early adopters and then by basically using them as champions, they tried to make and influence their other colleagues to use um, OU Analyze. And at the same time, of course, if teachers struggled, they knew, hey, my colleague down the hall knows how to work with OU Analyze. A, a third factor that we found was that in certain schools, departments and faculties, um, they were really keen to generate evidence. Does it work? Does it not work? Or spend a lot of time disseminating these findings. And we've, we basically see that this has an influence on whether or not teachers become enthusiastic about using OU Analyze. A fourth factor was the so-called digital literacy. Um, as we've seen from the previous exercise, um, OU Analyze is straightforward, but not straightforward. Some people feel very comfortable using OU Analyze, others not. You really have to know the system to make sense of it. And some teachers just don't feel competent to do this. And last but not least, there was this conception about teaching online. Currently, our um, so-called associate lecturers, uh, who basically support our students, they're not being paid to um, to uh, look at OE Analyze and rightfully so. Some teachers said, well, I'm not gonna look at this because this is not part of my role. 
Um, others thought, well, it's not my role to look at data. I'm here to teach, I don't know, 17th century poetry or 21st century physics. So why should I look at the data? So there's all this, these notions of what good teaching is basically were influencing whether or not teachers were um, keen to use these analytic systems or not. So the, um, currently where we're, where we're looking at is to see, can we provide these dashboards to students? We've made a conscious choice not to give these, uh, these data to students, primarily because we have such a diversity of students. You may remember from one of the slides that um, one out of eight students have a declared disability. And we have lots of students from impoverished backgrounds. And this might actually be quite detrimental if you are like, for example, Isaac, um, that is doing well on, on and off, or, or the, the, I forgot the name of the second person that we looked at, the, the lady, um, Maya, I think, you know, it would be quite disturbing for some if you see that you're red. Um, so what we're currently exploring with is, can we provide some kind of student recommender system to students that you see, for example, here? So it gives um, students the kind of um, pathways that we think would be appropriate for that particular student. And some initial results that we just published uh, with 22 undergraduate students, which we basically gave those dashboards. We basically found that the majority of students found the study recommender system to be useful because it allowed them to um, remind themselves which learning materials they had missed and which materials they still had to do. And quite surprisingly, it provided them as a, a means to directly accessing the content. So rather than clicking through the VLE continuously, they could just click on uh, Visual Block 1, Part 6, Wireless Communication and Mobile Computing. And they thought that was very, um, uh, very useful. Um, at the same time, the, the, the relative usefulness seemed to be influenced by, uh, by a certain amount of factors. So one thing was some really believed these dashboards and others were a little bit more skeptical. And the people who were more skeptical were particularly worried about um, how they were being compared to peers and whether or not they were uh, academically self-confident. And we found that so-called good students, students with high grades were much more comfortable using these systems than students who had not so good grades. So one potential concern could be is that by providing these dashboards, um, students who are already doing well get even more benefits while students are struggling might find it difficult. So we're still finding out the best way uh, forward. So um, Going back to um, the Paul EV question, and the, this gives me a t an opportunity to drink something, um, if you wouldn't mind, do you think that your institution, what you've seen thus far, do you think that um, your institution would benefit from implementing such learning analytic system? You can just say, true, I think this is a good thing, or false, what I've seen thus far, um, no, that would not work in my own institution. All right, so the, the majority thinks it's true, um, but there are also some people who say, well, it might not work in my own institution. So is anyone brave enough to say why you voted for true or why you voted for false? There is no right and wrong here. Um, maybe I can go. Um, yeah, sure. My institution, um, just during the pandemic, that, that was when we uh, observed the uptake of um, the learning management system because now it was a condition <laughs> we didn't have a choice but to start um, because it's it's um, it's a contact institution, mm -hmm. so um, most um, learning activities are done face to face, but um, the pandemic actually required that we start using the learning management system to its you know um, full capacity. And that means that um, 
we were able to collect more data, you know, during this two years um, period. Um, but I am not going to be able to say that this would work 100% going forward because there's still that um, uncertainty about where we're going. Are we going back to, you know, face to face? But from my own, from our own office, we are trying to encourage blended learning, you know, where the students also engage in, on the online um, um, using a learning management system virtually and then also engaging in the classroom. So it depends on what um, the leadership has decided or would decide in the future uh, about these um, resources that we've already put together during these two years. And that would define if we will be able to actually use this um, this type of learning analytics to um, to influence you know um, decisions or to improve students' activities um, or to improve students' learning learning um, um, paths. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for that, uh, Abdul Baki. And uh, I guess many institutions are in a similar uh, boat, if you like. Um, I work a lot with um, normal universities in between brackets who are not likely open university or not distance learning. And they're also struggling with this balance. You know, are we going back to blended or hybrid or some form? And how do we basically make sure that we can keep on following our students? And what uh, Z2 mentions in the chat, um, yeah, we, we, we really need to think about our digital literacy. Um, and we need to think about how we can best support our managers and lecturers and um, our students, because we, for example, assume that all students are comfortable with data, but we don't necessarily know whether that is um, true. Is there anyone else who wants to come in? Um, I can maybe add to that. I yeah, also Sarah. think, um, yeah, so I think it's very beneficial also from a lecturer's point of view, because I think a lot of lecturers, as much as, well, in our institution specifically, we want to get everything more online and, to, and more into blended learning, but they feel like, no, we don't want to do that. We can't see engagement. Uh, we don't know what our students are doing. So that's the barrier and that's what's stopping them from wanting to move to online. But I think when you bring in learning analytics, you can almost show them that there's even more you can see from having some of your content online. And it's not that you can no longer see how your students are engaging or know what they're doing. Um, you can even get more from it and actually help students more specifically in where they might need help where you wouldn't really see in a physical classroom. So I think that it's very helpful for the lecturers to kind of get them more on board with um, wanting to teach online and in blended learning. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, quite, you're absolutely right, Sarah. And quite interestingly, um, I will dig out the paper a little bit later, but we did an experiment for two years with a Czech university um, who was, uh, it was before COVID. The only data they had were uh, student assessment data. They had no virtual learning environment data. And the only thing we did there was to um, basically run the algorithms and then see which students might need a little bit more help purely based on the assessment data. And um, it was done with a course of engineering. And um, we were able to show that just having the opportunity to collect the data and then having follow-up conversation with students who were potentially in these amber or red categories, um, that already had a substantial impact on the way how teachers engage with students, but also students like, oh, we're suddenly, you know, we're somebody listens to me or is, is taking care of me. And we found that um, we had a very nice letter from the rector that said that the retention improved from 40% to almost 90% um, since we used OE Analyze. But he, he wrote in a, in a kind, kind of funny way, could you please send help? Because our lecture rooms in year two are not big enough to accommodate the new uh, group of students. So it, it's a little bit of an anecdote, but I think what is nice of this story is it doesn't need to be a fully fledged, you know, all bells and whistles approach, just having some predictive analytics in your system by, with some very basic data could already be really insightful. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, so the next part that I would like to talk about is learning design, because I think learning design is perhaps the, the, the oftentimes a kind of missing piece in using really powerful learning analytics. And the, the reason why I say this will hopefully become clear 
in a in a minute. And then a recent review by how learning design is uh, being used in Europe, and of course, this, this is Europe. This is not in uh, Southern Africa. Um, Barbara Wasson and Paul Kirsten basically stated that the Open University was one of the few people that was able to link uh, conceptually the link between learning design, so what teachers do in terms of their um, construction of course designs with what students are actually doing based on what teachers are designing. And the reason why we think this is so useful is that if we can better map how teachers are designing courses, we can then start to see whether or not our students are following that or not. And if they're not following that, how can we then make sure that these things are better aligned? So we have under a Creative Commons license, we have a so-called um, Open University Learning Design Initiative, where we map teachers into seven categories. So currently you're listening to me and you're watching, and this is what is called so-called assimilative um, information. It could well be that you're also finding more about this particular framework. So you perhaps you're at the same time Googling what is the Aldi framework? Or perhaps what we were just discussing in a minute with Sarah or Abdul Baki or others is to have communication, to talk between each other and to talk in groups. Um, that's another learning activity. You could actually do some productive activity. I could give you some uh, learning analytics data and you can play around with that or you can experience what it's like to work in a dashboard. Or we did some interactive activities with the uh, Paul EV element. Or I might do at the end of this, um, this workshop a test um, and see if you remember what we've been talking about. And <laughs> don't worry, I won't. Um, but by mapping these seven kind of activities, what we are basically doing is trying to get a kind of brain scan of what teachers are expecting students to do. And then by having the brain scan of what teachers think the students should be doing and linking that with what students are actually doing, you can see if there is a potential mismatch in terms of engagement or not. And what you see here in a quite scary graph, this is the Open University, or at least this was the Open University in 2016. So what you see here is that there's a lot of so-called um, watching and listening activities. So around 40% of our courses spend a lot of time um, giving students in useful information about learning a particular discipline. With one course, course 53, giving nearly 90% uh, of assimilated activities. And then there's certain courses that provide a lot of assessment, um, in particular course 57 and 157. And then you have all these courses in the middle. So for example, for me, as a, as a practical learner, I would love to be in course 94 because there is 60% of the course is about doing certain activities. So maybe as a next exercise for the Paul EV course, um, it would be really nice if you could indicate, you have, a, you have one, one choice, one dot, if you could indicate where you think, if you're teaching in your institution or where you think you know, you're teaching, uh, most of your teachers are, where do you think your teachers are spending most of their time in terms of, teaching, which of these seven activities do you think is representing your institution? And it's anonymous, so don't worry about it. You can just post a, a point wherever you are. So somebody just posted, um, oh, it's mostly assimilative. Um, yeah, <laughs> okay, thus far it's mostly assimilative. Yo, hooray, somebody said finding information, great. Okay, there's a, somebody else says productive. So while, while we're throwing darts at this, uh, at this virtual uh, board, is there anyone keen to talk about, you know, um, what does a typical course at your university look like? Uh, so that we get a, get a little bit of flavor of, of the course design in your, in your course. And there's, again, there's no right and wrong. We're all amongst friends here. Okay, I will I will take a step because I'm, I'll talk about my experience. Yeah, not cool. so much Thank you, being, in class, being in a classroom. Um, so my experience have been in the 
uh, the, the very first one, which is the assimilation side of things and, the, and finding information with a little bit of productive, but it's not too much with the, because there were practice um, activities that you needed to do to submit your assignment. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And this I'm talking about a postgraduate qualification that, um, yeah, it was supposed to be a hands-on qualification, <laughs> but I found it to be in the very first block hmm. where there were a lot of material posted and loaded, but um, not so much in terms of engagement hmm. done, yeah. Yeah, and I find it personally really difficult because I'm also much more in the middle space, but doing a, a, a workshop at a distance is very difficult um, to make it engaging. But I personally would love, I mean, if we would do this face-to-face, -face, I would hope that there's lots of interaction, like, for example, in Roger's uh, seminar. But I can see that for most of the courses, most of you ticked um, uh, have you assimilated, which there's nothing wrong with that. That would fit a lot of students at the Open University as well. But um, yeah, there are also some really interesting uh, patterns emerging there. So knowing then basically what your course might look like, what we're then basically doing, sorry, is trying to map how does the way our teachers design course at the OP University, how does that then influence what our students are doing? And we did this analysis in 2016 and replicated this in 2017. Um, we basically identified uh, four different types of teachers. Of course, this is a, this is a, this is a crude a summary, but we found um, certain teachers who mostly designed lots of um, individual learning activities, which we call constructivist learning. There were some teachers that had strong as assessment activities. Then there were some teachers, like Elizabeth mentioned, who were supposed to do lots of productive hands-on activities. And then last but not least, there were uh, courses that were so-called social constructivist in nature. So lots of working together um, activities. And what we found um, was that there was a positive predictive value in terms of how teachers design courses and what students were actually doing. So if you design lots of individual learning activities, um, students tended to work slightly less over time. Well, if we put students into groups, it seemed that students were spending more time over time in the virtual learning environment. And what we found was that this did not significantly predict whether or not students were happy about the course or whether they were um, able to pass the course. But what we found was a really interesting tension. Our students loved um, being taught in a way that was so-called uh, constructivist, so giving them lots of materials, lots of individual tasks to do, and they absolutely hated working together. It was one of the biggest predictive factors was whether or not they had to work together with others. And this could be a reflection of the OP University context we're working in. But at the same time, the biggest predictor whether or not students continued and actually completed the course was whether or not students were forced by the teacher, if you like, to uh, work together. And we initially analyzed this data on an aggregate level. And then in follow-up work, we did this also on a week-by-week -week basis. And we again found very similar effects where indeed <clears throat> how teachers design um, communication activities and in particular also assessments substantially influence um, student retention. Um, and quite interestingly, and this is a visualization of um, one particular course, what we found was that how teachers design courses really fundamentally influences what students are doing. So I'm going to give you an example of a computer science course. Um, there's no right and wrong. Um, but what you see here is... Um, the, the workload per week and the workload per week in, in our course is around 10 hours that you can see here. And in week one of the course, the students are spending 10 hours on reading and watching about a particular course, then finding information one and a half hours, working in groups for one hour, doing some productive activities for a bit, et cetera, et cetera. And the teacher had a... Um, activity that was basically programming a first computer programming task, which was marked and they 
uh, had to read about the assignments, they had to experimentally code, and they were assessed, and they were assessed. And he, uh, in this particular case, then um, decided, okay, that would amount to, let's like, say, 35 and a half hours in week five. In week so this teacher is a really smart guy, so he gave students free the, the week before to work on these assignments. So any predictions what the the um, the uh, student actually brain scan of the teachers. This what is what the teacher thinks is a good design, and I'm not saying it's good or bad. Or what did you think the students did? And any guesses? They had a free week. <laughs> mm -hmm. So let's have a look. Um, so the, the beauty is, of course, with all this analytics, you can actually then see, okay, what is happening. Mm -hmm. So here you see um, the same course, uh, the same mapped out activities. Um, you see when there are peaks and troughs and you can see the uh, virtual learning engagement per week uh, indicated in a red line. So what, 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 does, what does it mean? What can you see in this lovely, uh, lovely visualization? Again, there's no right and wrong. There, it's just uh, nice data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it correlates very strongly with activities. And as uh, and, and, uh, Nilma, sorry, um, uh, indicated that even when a teacher indicated, well, in week four, you're not supposed to do anything, there was a substantial amount of um, engagement by students. And actually in follow-up analysis, most of the students um, worked ahead of time to make sure that once the assignments were in place, that you know they've actually got everything ready to uh, go any any idea what's happening between week 11 and week 14 what could that be yes yeah, students prepping for the assignments but are they prepping for uh, three weeks yeah it's term break it's um uh, the uk follows the uh, the um, northern calendar so it's christmas and you can also see um, Easter in here. And what is really interesting from, from our students' perspective is that we have quite a lot of engagement during the festive breaks, because that's when students are basically catching up on, uh, on work. And of course, this is just an example of one course, but if you do this over hundreds of courses, what we found, and this is quite uh, startling, is that two thirds of how students are behaving on a week by week basis is determined by us, by teachers. And so I'm gonna repeat that because it's oftentimes when I talk to my teachers at the Open University, they're always complaining about the students not working hard enough and not getting it. But what our research continuously shows is that how we as teachers design courses fundamentally influences whether or not um, students have a successful learning experience. So this is in a way um, really exciting. And it, and it helps us to basically, you know, understand, okay, no matter what all these data show you, if you wouldn't see, if you would just imagine to see the red line of the VLE engagement without the colored data about what teachers are expecting, you would see lots of peaks and troughs in your data but you wouldn't make out, as you did very successfully, that it seems that the peaks and troughs are tremendously related to when assessments are taking place. Or a critical reader might say, okay, there's always a peak when there are certain assessments, but why is there no peak in week 20? So perhaps in week 20, this, the assignments are um, too easy, or perhaps the assignments is, are so well designed, but perhaps the assignments in week four or five and week 14, 15, or week 22, 23 are too heavy. And that's why you see this massive peak. 
So um, having seen this, do you think that an institution like yours, do you think it would be useful to also think about um, implementing these kind of learning design on top or next to learning analytics? So that's where everything is, everyone believes it's true or no one is, is, um, is able to link the, to, the, uh, to the survey. Does anyone want to speak up why you think it would be useful to implement this, um, this learning design? Hi there, hi Bart. Hi. How you doing? I'm very well. How are you? Good man. Good man. My, my name is Milika Nukamza. I'm from UKZN. Uh, I'm an instructional designer. And so for me, anything that has to do with data is highly beneficial. I mean, data allows you to predict any issues, um, allows you to see certain trends. Now, the only thing for me would be the extra work that you'd be giving to someone who doesn't love data, mm. you know, just simply, um, I don't know, you know, just like a normal lecture of another subject, you know, how do we, you know, just, I don't know, engage them, for example, either how little data we present maybe at first and then allow a person to maybe dig deeper and further into more data but there is just that little bit of a hurdle, I think, for someone who just doesn't um, subscribe to the same Bible. Yeah, thank you so much for that, uh, Malika. And I couldn't agree uh, more. I mean, of course, I love data and we probably all love data because otherwise we wouldn't be here. But how do we convince people who are scared by this and um, don't see this as part of their day job? So thank you for sharing that. And that's a big, 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 um, big hurdle. Uh, I think Stanford, you raised your hand. Uh, thank you. I am not so sure if this fits in, but uh, my thinking is that it's true and it's false. The reason being that I think if um, the learning is not well designed, it may not necessarily bring out the desired outcome. Mm. And it's true if the instrument is well designed and then it will bring the desired, uh, the desired learning outcome. Uh, mm. That's my contribution. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And to me, I mean, for me, learning analytics and learning design is a marriage made in heaven because no matter how good your learning analytics profile is, if you, if you don't know what, what the, the drivers behind it, the teachers are, it's difficult to know. But at the same time, we continuously use the learning analytics data to talk to teachers to see whether or not they could potentially reconsider their design. So... For example, this particular teacher readjusted their workload allocation based on the data that we shared to him and then said, yeah, maybe it's not such a good idea to design it in this particular week. So he then altered it. And then the next year, we then had a look at, OK, does the alteration of his learning design, did that then lead to a positive influence on students' retention? So you can basically always use your data to further improve your uh, design. So I think uh, Abdul Baki had a um, raised hand. So um, yeah. So I think what my comment is very close to um, your just completed comments is about um, continuous improvement, and I think that should be the ultimate goal. And if you have that in mind, if you are not able to measure, you know, your metrics that would help you to improve, then um, you definitely would not go anywhere because. You're, you're not able to manage the current situation or what is going into what you, you are building. So um, I think it's very essential to know those variables and those constructs that kind of impact on your, um, your development or the improvement of your course. So it's necessary to, at a design level, to even include the analytics um, elements before even um, implementing you know, the course on your learning management system. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing it. Couldn't agree more. Sarah? 
Yeah, I just wanted to say, because I, I just agree with everything you've been saying, um, especially with learning design and learning analytics. So what I've actually been looking at recently is how, um, so obviously if you have a course that's not very engaging, so it's a lot of reading, um, I call it consumption, what I'm <laughs> Yeah, like that, yeah. Things like that, you can't really tell much about engagement you can't really get much analytics from it other than consumption analytics or how much time they're spending on it so then what we what i've been looking at is how if you design a course based on different pedagogies which are leveled so consumption is the lowest then it goes up to curation which is sort of like assignments and researching mm -hmm. conversation which is talking um working in groups um anyways it goes on but Based on what the activity is and how it's been designed, if a student interacts with that activity, there's sort of factors that you can see just purely based on the fact that they interacted with that activity, they did better in the course overall. Mm. So, or they were less likely to drop out. And then each of those pedagogies became different predictors. So it was so interesting to see that just purely based on how the course was designed, the students were just going through the steps if they did certain activities and ones that were more engaging, they did well. But if how most courses are these days, they're very consumption based, a lot of just watching videos, mm. there's only, uh, yeah, you can't really get, get as much information from that on the one side, but on the other side, you also, the students could be doing even better if you um, design more activity into your course and more engagement. So it's like, on both sides, it's so important with the way lecturers do design their courses or how it's put online. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we as teachers and we as instructional designers have such a fundamental impact on our learners' experience. And I think there's a there's a new uncharted territory with us being able to link um, what we're designing with how our students are reacting. And therefore it's 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 great because we can then start to unpack what works for some and may not work for others. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm mindful of time, but uh, let's take one more um, to go. Uh, sorry, I, I, um, totally, sorry, I don't know. How okay, it's okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine, it's fine, Prof. <laughs> um, <clears throat> mine, mine is just a, a comment really, and I, I was doubtful in even um, contributing because um, I'm actually so, um, I'm, I'm responding to what I'm learning from this uh, presentation. I'm, I'm coming a little bit from a technical background and I think <clears throat> concepts like uh, learning designs are things that are, you know, um, less familiar to me. So, 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 I mean, I was just uh, running some imagination here to say, you know, often when you get dumped with a data source, um, you know, if, if you are, um, if you are following an expect design, you can learn about all these measures, you know, um, that people are, um, are using elsewhere that can really help you to kind of uh, give the kind of insights that you need. But often when you go into the data, a lot of those measures are not, you know, possible because some of the information is not there. And I'm, I'm, I just couldn't help but uh, wonder when you talk about the marriage between learning analytics and learning design, you know, to what extent is it possible for people to say, you know, we're going to design our cause, you know, and in, in a way that we are intentional also on how we want to measure success, you know, from it, you know, so, so, so that all these things that are key to measure um, success you you don't find out whether they are possible or not. Um, you know, once the system is there and running, but you actually become very intentional about designing your course in such a way that these measures are derivable. Thanks. Yeah, this is a fantastic link also to this slide because, of course, um, the downside of any learning analytics system is that, of course, you focus on things which are easily measurable. So. Um, what you see on this particular latest development we're working on with a range of European universities is to help teachers to automatically um, allow them to map all these learning designs. And then this particular course is about teaching entrepreneurial competences. So if you're very skeptical, you could say, well, how would you know that spending uh, 62 and a half hours on acquisition or 
um, as I think Sarah mentioned, consumption, which I think is a great term, and uh, 1,140 1, minutes on production. How do we know that this actually leads to entrepreneurial competencies? Um, if, for example, at the end of this course, I don't know what, what the course actually is about, is just you know a multiple choice test towards the end. Shouldn't we, for example, in this case, develop a learning analytics metrics that measures whether or not students are really becoming entrepreneurial and whether they've developed those competencies. So I guess what I'm trying to say in an inarticulate way is um, we should, um, somebody was, was uh, mentioning this on the, at a very interesting conference, we should uh, measure what we value rather than value what we measure. Um, and it, it is difficult and um, obviously, we understand these nuances, but of course, once you put them in a dashboard, people will start to um, optimize it based on whatever is depicted in these visualizations. So we have to be really careful what we're um, interested in. So what I wanted to show with this particular uh, visualization, which I think also was previously raised, about how could you use learning design in, um, in a non-online environment. And in this particular case, I didn't bring an example with me. But um, when teachers are working through mapping their course design, they could indicate how much of their time is online, how much of that is face-to-face, -face, uh, how much is synchronous or ain't synchronous, et cetera, et cetera. Is a teacher present, is a teacher not present? So um, there's a lot of work in progress. The tool is freely available. Um, if you click on the website and the links are again in the, in the uh, slide share. And another thing that I just wanted to show because I'm mindful of time is how do we know that the learning design is fit for purpose for our students? So most of the work I've thus far shown you is um, across a large cohort of students. But in latest work by Samam Reshvi, she uh, looked at um, students from across the globe and how they responded in uh, MOOCs and massive online open courses, how students responded to particular learning activities. And she found that uh, students from, let's say, Africa um, reacted very differently to students, let's say, from Latin America or uh, Asia in terms of how they engage with courses. So we found basically in our research that when we're designing courses, we often design it based on the kind of UK perspective. Um, and that in a way advantages UK students, while other students from different regions like Latin America or perhaps, I don't know, Asia might prefer different types of learning activities. And again, the great thing about learning analytics is that we can then start to see, okay, which types of designs work best for which types of students. And potentially in the near future, we could then start to offer slightly different versions to slightly different students. So some further reflection, because I want to leave a couple of minutes for questions. Um, big questions to ask is who owns the data? Is it you? Is it the institution? Is it the student? And what about the ethics of doing all this, in, in all these studies? What about the professional development of our teachers, as mentioned before? And a critique, which I think was really good uh, by Paul Kirchner. He um, reviewed our work and he was basically saying, well, the work at the Open University is great, but perhaps the Open University is optimizing the record player. So we're continuously fine tuning and fine tuning um, our course designs based on our learning analytics. But maybe rather than optimizing within a box, perhaps we should throw away the box and start completely new um, rather than playing um, old uh, records on our old record label. So I hope that by showing you these two big examples. I hope and hopefully I've shown to you that you need those clear management support. You need to work in a bottom-up way with your teachers. Hopefully by gathering evidence, you can convince some critical uh, friends and colleagues that what you're doing is right. Um, I hope that you realize that um, these innovations take time, but you need planning and it's all about people. So I'm really looking forward to your questions and if not, then um, that was also great to talk to you. So thanks, thanks, and um, looking forward to hear if there are any comments or questions. Patrick, you have a question? Um, yes, thank you. Um, so I have a question and just a comment also. 
Um, my question is in regards to the, um, there was a slide where you had um, shown the, you know, the use of your um, learning analytics. Was it the learning analytics? Yeah. Um, and then I was just thinking it would be nice to see, I know most of the, the variables there were kind of social influence, you know, um, in regards to um, then being uh, the lecturers being asked to use the um, the tool, you know, because or uh, maybe um, the uh, management asked them to use it. But I think it would be interesting to see other factors like, um, say, the gender, the age, the experience, you know, and maybe you could look at this ETAX model. That's the unified technology um, adoption um, adoption model, with regards to those other. Um, um okay yeah with regards to those other factors that would help us to understand more um uh, when it comes to the adoption of this kind of um tool what exactly is being influencing their behavioral intention to use or the actual use of the system um then one other comment is about um um culture so i think culture is a very big thing when it comes to change um, or uh, especially when it, yeah, actually change or change management. And I feel even teachers themselves, because from the office that I sit in, um, we do um, staff capacity development. And what I've also noticed is that even staff themselves, lecturers themselves, they fail to engage when they are in, in sessions like this and they expect their own students to engage. So I think we um, both staff, both um, um, teachers and students actually need to to um, have that culture change about how they, they engage in, in um, virtual spaces um, and maybe on, in their course also. So I, I think it's both ways and that's quite interesting. This is a professor, I haven't done any research about it, but it is what I have observed, so thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for your questions and also thank you very much for being so active in this. Of course, I couldn't show everything, um, so one thing that our predictive learning analytics models does indeed is to look at um, demographic variables. And together with the student union, we um, had our first, first ethics policy in the world in 2014, where we worked together which variables are we um, allowed to use and which ones we're not allowed to use. And we revisit that every year together with the students uh, union. And if you're interested in that, um, Google Open University Ethics Policy Learning Analytics, and then you can freely use that. And what was quite interesting is that from purely a predictive learning analytics point of view, um, all these demographics are interesting um, until week one. Um, once the first week of the course starts, the actual engagement of students in the course is much more predictive than um, um, than what um, what um, what teachers might think. So in our OU Analyze system, for example, um, teachers are able to. Um, um, sorry, I'm showing you the wrong screen. Um, teachers are able to sort based on um, all kinds of questions uh, of analytics, like for example, their socioeconomic income, or. Um, what kind of accessibility needs they might have. I'm, I'm waiting for the system to load. Um, but many of these factors that I'm listing here, uh, passing probability, gender, um, the, the region they're from, their occupation, age, et cetera, et cetera. Many of these factors basically disappear once we basically have good and data about students' actual engagement. So I guess it, my uh, my gut feeling is let's remove all those, but our teachers find it really useful. And you're absolutely right in terms of culture. And I guess what our research continuously shows is what may work in one faculty, even in the same institution, will not work in another. Um, so how can we make sure that we can actually learn from each other, let alone learn from across different uh, cultures? Um, all right, so I hope that answered your question. Uh, Dwali, uh, you want to come in? Next one, yes. Okay. Thank you, um, Prof. <clears throat> um, I think, uh, Prof, thank you very much. Firstly, let me just say that this was a very 
um, informative uh, presentation uh, certainly did learn uh, a lot from this and um, I'm really amazed uh, by the system. I'm sorry that um, uh, I will always be, you know, almost biased to the technical uh, capabilities, but I'm very, very impressed. Um, Prof, so I haven't been in this forum for a very long time, but you know, a couple of years ago, I did visit Milton Keynes uh, from my previous institution. And uh, one of that uh, Bayesian learning um, model that you shared, you know, was, was presented to us. And, you know, I've, I've never been the same uh, since then. And a couple of years <clears throat> down the line, you know, I've have I have a better understanding of these things than I, I did before. And and my question is that when we start looking at um you know um using this kind of sophistications to build models that can help us like, that can help us predict, um how do you govern to ensure that these these issues of biasness, um, you know, are, are, are handled as as uh, adequately as they can. And, and I'm asking this question because <clears throat> often you find that with a big deck like uh, the one that you have uh, shown, you find that uh, mostly the design is is expert led, and in in some cases. Um, it can be data led, but probabilistic mm. issues on the data sometimes leads to almost, you know, an entire expert led. And then, and my issue is that, of course, you then have an individual who who will who will, you know, make a lot of decisions. And how how do you govern that? And how how what kind of structures do you put in place to ensure that the people who can review what those algorithms are doing? that they can work with something that is not too far away from them to be able to contribute and weigh in on, on what the algorithm should be doing. I think the, the, the last point there, um, Prof, is that, um, and I think you've really communicated well that this is something that will need time. But my question, I'm thinking that I'm imagining if you really wanted to start, you know, you know, um, what is the real effort? I mean, can you do this with a team uh, to get a couple of guys together within the institution? Um, how, how much of the outside help, um, you know, um, uh, did you get in putting a system like this together? Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I don't know how, how realistic one can be in terms of uh, if, if you're really going to take on a project like this, what are the things that you have to um, take into account? And um, I think you've already answered my, my, my very last point. It was with regards to the adoption. And you made a comment there about uh, somebody says they teach English and they're not here for the data. Um, and, and I've actually had responses similar to that. And it, it boggled me how, um, because I'm on the support side, how a lecturer could not see the potential of, of how this data can help them. And, you know, and I asked this question a little bit earlier, they, they almost always defer or refer this to, to college administrators and so on. But I don't know if you can maybe, maybe um, at high level, uh, maybe give ideas or thoughts on, in your experience, what has been the single biggest contributor in getting the lectures to adopt, you know, the people that we need them to, to kind of champion these things? Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I guess, I mean, whether you're starting big or small, um, the, the, the thing I've learned most is that um, you need a couple of people who are eager to willing to take risk. And if you if you have a couple of teachers, perhaps in, in your computing department or perhaps in, in the department that are comfortable with data, um, if you link them with people in your technical administration and perhaps some educational researchers, build a really small agile team, they can quite quickly make some big results. Um, we're not expecting you to immediately, you know, I mean, all the systems that we've built are built by the Open University and they're publicly available. But how do you make the first step? And that, that, that's difficult. And I tend to prefer to work in small interdisciplinary teams. 
Um, and by bringing those small teams together and pilot with one or two courses, you can see what works and doesn't work and then gradually build it up over time. Um, but this works again in the UK context. Um, we spent three or four years together with UNISA um, and I appreciate it's very different over there. Um, so, um, and I, I'm not sure if somebody from UNISA is here today, but it's difficult. There's, if, it, if it was easy, it would have been done already years ago. So um, take it one step at a time. Uh, Carmelita, you want to take over? Thank you. Do we still have five minutes for any last comments or questions? If not, then we can hand over. And I'll just say thank you very much to um, Prof. Rinkis for this wonderful and very interesting and very educational um, workshop. It is was really eye-opening what can be achieved with learner analytics. So if that is it, thank you very much. And I'll hand over to the SAA um, Exco, if not to Elizabeth. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Camerita. Um, unfortunately, uh, you're handing over back to me. Um, <laughs> My job is very easy. I want to also release you um, well in um, in advance, like in, in five minutes, I want to get to that. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you to everyone who registered and participated in this workshop without you guys. We wouldn't have had a successful um, workshop. At some point, we had about 84 participants in, in the room. And that is a biggest, biggest milestone in terms of this workshop, in terms of the Lena Analytic Institute in SAA. Um, and I hope even in the future, the number will grow as we, we learn more about learning analytics and Lena analytics and student analytics and student success, as we want all of us to improve um, how our students, um, succeed at the end of the, uh, their qualification as well. So I would love to also thank all our facilitators for today. They were phenomenal. I, I think um, a month ago when I, I, I was really looking for organizers or facilitators, I, I panicked a little bit because I didn't know most of them. But after today, I think um, they will be receiving lots and lots of emails from all the South African colleagues who are here to learn more about this space, which is a very interesting space. Um, I would like to thank um, Prof. Skete, who started um, with a note in terms of uh, there is a student behind the data. And I think from all the three workshops that we had today, we've learned that they, they are students, they are human beings behind the data that we work with. Um, and I want to also um, thank um, Dr. Tai, Yishan Tai, uh, Roger Skalisa and Bart Yerikis for all the workshop and for sharing your, your work with us um, and imparting your knowledge with, with us in South Africa. So don't be surprised when your inboxes become in flux because of the wonderful work that you did. I also want to thank um, the SAA team. Um, as a co-opted member of SAA leading this forum, uh, the Institute, um, on behalf of SAA, we would love to um, thank UWC for hosting us in day one. Um, and we will see you tomorrow. I also want to acknowledge Karen. She should be sending you um, the feedback from links that you need to complete for day one and day two. Please, we value very much your, your input so that we can improve from here onwards as well. Um, and I would also like to thank my team from UWC, everyone who facilitated the session today. Even tomorrow, please come back ready to continue this journey. Don't forget tomorrow we're starting um, the session at 
half past eight is just registration, but the session will start normally at nine o'clock. Um, and I also want to appreciate our UWC choir for allowing us to use their content um, to entertain you throughout the session because you were going to get bored throughout the whole day if we didn't have them entertaining us and sharing their talent with us. So I would like to send my appreciation to them as well. I will see you tomorrow. Have a lovely, am I, did I make it five minutes? Yay, I made it. Um, if there are any comments, query questions, you are more than welcome to, to comment. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. If not, bye, enjoy. I'm giving you the rest of the afternoon free to enjoy. Bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, colleagues.